All right, good afternoon class. Uh, this is the uh, promised video tutorial for uh, Lab 13 simulation modeling. So uh, I'm not going to repeat what's in the overview and the introduction, but just uh, very briefly what we're doing is uh, using a computer model to essentially implement a series of experiments uh, on optimal foraging. And essentially what uh, the computer model has done is taken all that math that you went through in the last lab on optimal foraging and put it into some computer code. And then it's built a little virtual world and it's created little virtual agents, hunters and animals that move around in that world. And uh, they act, uh, especially the hunters are acting, according to the logic that we discussed in a lecture on optimal foraging and decision-making theory. And uh, essentially are using the math you went through in the last lab to decide, the hunter is deciding whether or not it's going to go after this specific prey or wait to find a prey that's higher ranked. So essentially what you want to do is you want to go to the page in Canvas read through it, read through the procedure, and then click on this link that's in there. It's the link that says, this is my own website, dietbreadth.html. And you'll get a tab in your browser that take a little while to load up and it'll look like this. So this is a software called NetLogo. It's the software I use to create the model. You can download the NetLogo software to your computer and run it, it's in Java. But luckily they make these little um, make the models that you write in it you can export them into a web format so that's what I did I uploaded this to my website and this is the interface that you get so just very briefly what we're looking at here is this window is the graphical output when we run the model we'll see things moving around here these little windows down here are um, they make plots little graphs that track certain statistics through time the number of prey taken of the different species and how much energy the foragers actually have. This little area up here, we call these sliders. And what these are, they let you change the input values into the model. So remember there's things like uh, how much energy does it take to search for a particular you know, resource or how much energy or time does it take to process that one and how frequently you're gonna run across that particular animal in, in the landscape. That's what most of these sliders do. And then you set up how many foragers and how many prey. All of those things interact with each other, so I'll go through that here in a little bit. But briefly, before we even get going on here, I just want to show you that uh, there are a couple other tabs down here. Um, the Command Center tab over here doesn't really have much in it, uh, so you can skip that one. The code, if you're into computer programming, you can actually look at the code that was written to create this model. But probably the most interesting one is the model info tab at the bottom. And here it gives a very nice high level overview of the model, what all of these individual things actually are. Whoops. Look at that. Isn't that fun? There we go. Okay. Um, what actually each individual one of these sliders actually are, how they relate to the actual optimal forging uh, equation that we wrote out before. And then it gives you just a couple of ideas. For example, for experiments to to you know to do, so definitely definitely worth reading through this and trying to make sure you understand what all the sliders are doing. Of course, you can just randomly move them around and see some interesting stuff, but if you want to make sense of it, you should know exactly what those things are. Okay, so if you're ready to go, the basic steps are this: you have the sliders wherever you want them. You hit setup the world initiates and you see all the individual characters, the agents in our model here. I have one forager, that's this little fellow right here with a spear, and then I have 200 prey animals and they are split evenly between species 1, 2, 3, and 4. And each of these has its own value in terms of how much energy you're going to get when you actually end up eating the thing. So 25, in my case, 25, 25, 15, and 15. Then they have the cost that is going to, how much time or energy it's going to take you to actually process them 
once you encounter them. Remember, so once you come across them in the woods or wherever, you have to track them down, kill them, uh, butcher them, cook them, and then eat them. So all of that time is the processing time. And then you have a density. Uh, and so the density is how prevalent they are in the environment. And that relates to the search cost. So a lower density means a longer search time. It costs more for the forager. Forager has to move or move many more times before they are likely to run across that animal. And of course, that density in the simulation model is going to change over time. As the animals are hunted, they're depleted. And so the density for any of those particular prey is going to go down over time. And so a prey animal that is highly ranked in the beginning of the simulation, if it gets overhunted, it will become rarer, the search cost will increase, and so potentially a lower ranked resource will move up the chain to replace that. Now the question is, under which scenarios are you going to get a very broad diet? They're going to get all the animals if they come across them, they're going to eat all of them. And under which scenarios are you going to get a specialty diet? Only one or maybe only two animals. So that's a very reasonable set of experiments that you can start to, to do. So you got the sliders where you want them. You hit setup, the world initialize. And every time you hit setup, you see it, it puts the animals in a slightly different random position. And then you hit run, and it's just going to go. And every time the forager has come across an animal and decided to hunt it, you're going to get a little red dot popping up. That's just a little visual cue for you to see, oh, they did a hunt. And we can see it's taking, in this case, a lot of time for that forger to actually find anything and his energy is going down generally. So that's not a good thing. We definitely don't want the energy to go down to zero because then the poor forager has died. And over here, it's counting the number of each different species that the hunter has, has encountered and decided to go hunt and kill. So initially, species one has the highest value when you do all of these things, and so they are focusing on that. Somewhere around, uh, yeah, somewhere around 200 or so ticks, that changed. The density of species one went down, and they started focusing on species two. And of course, species one sort of rebounded, and they also started looking at species, oh yeah, species three, and then species two. And then eventually, way down the line, at 657 steps into the model, they finally brought in species uh, four. Um, and now they're focusing on all of them. And you can see here, this is a species taken in the last 10 years. So they're taking, they're having a broad diet at this particular moment. They're waiting for the prey animals to, the density is going down for the higher ranked ones, and they're going to the low ranked ones. And then the model does allow the species to replenish themselves slowly. They're slowly rebounding. And so they're in this sort of state of dynamic equilibrium where they are going after, <clears throat> we would call this a broad spectrum diet. That'd be the anthropological lingo. Now, you can let this run as long as you want, uh, but an experiment should run for a predetermined number of steps, as close as possible to it as you can get. So in this case, we're getting close to 2,000 time steps. As soon as it gets right around there, it's not going to be exact because you're just sort of doing this manually. Hit run again and it stops. And now at this point, you could consider if you were doing this as an experiment where you set up these values, you could consider this to be a finalized experiment. And what you can do is export this by downloading a JPEG or PNG or even a PDF of this or you can even print it out if you wanted to. So you do that and it should pop up and says what you want. And so eventually you're gonna come up with two experiments. So what you'd wanna do if this was experiment one is up there, label it. Experiment one, pray taken JPEG. And I'm gonna save this just, uh, I don't know, in my downloads folder for lack of a better place. And what you can do is once that downloads, you can open it up in a graphics program like so. And you can paste it into your Google Sheet or your, you know, Google um, Docs if you're writing in that or Word or whatever you're doing. You can write 
just paste this in as a figure. So you're going to want to do that in your write-up. So here you go. That's the uh, model result from 0 to 2,000 years showing the time going by on the x-axis and the number of each different species that were taken throughout the model. And you can talk about the temporal dynamics or the change over time. They started out only going after the highest ranked species one. Um, after uh, 300 or so time cycles, the density of species one likely went down. They brought in the second ranked one, species three. And then only after about 400 cycles did they bring in the third species. And only after about 600 cycles did they bring in species four, right? And you can talk about how these values relate to that pattern. And you can do that, you could do that with forager energy too. It's less informative perhaps than the prey taken one. Uh, but you certainly can do it that way. So now what you want to do is to do a second experiment. And I want you to play around with these values. These are my default values. So I want you to play around with them first and see how messing with them changes. So let's make species one have a really high food value, like 60, right? And just so you know, the energy value of the forager, it comes from these things. So every time the forager is going to kill the species one, they're going to get 60 food values minus the processing cost. Okay. So if all I did is move that one slider, I set up my world again and I hit run. And what we're going to see is our fella, it's going to change things a little bit, perhaps. It looks like in this case, even though species one is highly ranked, <clears throat> because the food value is so high, they killed all of them right off the bat. <laughs> and now it looks like they got faster to a broad spectrum. So that was unexpected. That's kind of an interesting thing. So you could let this run to 2,000 if you wanted to, or, or 1,000, or however long you want to run it. But I'm satisfied at this moment. So again, I'm just at first I want you to fool around with these sliders, move them around a little bit, uh, increase the processing cost for some, decrease the density for others, and just hit setup and run, and see what happens. See what happens as they run over time. So probably eventually what you want to do is to be a little bit systematic about this. So what you could do is to say let's just let's just set up a situation in which uh, the last two species have very low food values, very high processing costs, um, and very low densities. So just sort of take them out of the equation. And let's talk about these two. Let's set their food value to be essentially the same, their processing costs to be the same, but let's make one of them a little bit more dense, 10% more dense, right? And so now you can hit setup. So now you can see there's only two species. You can hit run. And now you might be able to control, you know, what the impact of density is a little bit tighter than if you had so many other things moving around. And so this could be interesting and you're looking at the time cycle between prey one and prey two. And it looks like it's all one or all the other. So they're fluctuating back and forth as the density goes down and back up. So you let that run for however many ticks you desire, a thousand, let's say, and then you would save out that plot. And then your second experiment would be, let's change the density a lot higher than that. Let's go 20% more. So 35. Set up again and hit run. And what are the differences? How long does it take, right, until you get into that fluctuation? Do you even ever get into that fluctuation? It looks like the fluctuations are a lot longer in terms of their time period, and they don't seem to pass each other. In fact, it looks uh, very long until they pass each other. And now they've reached some sort of weird dynamic equilibrium here in the middle, which is kind of interesting. So you can let that run out and then have that as one. And then you could make another time step or another step in density. So that one's way denser. Hit set up and you can see that right here and you can hit run. And you can see how that changes the timing, the temporal pattern in this. Uh, and so what I would do is to come up with a couple of experiments where you keep things controlled. You could do like I did and change it to just two species 
or you could keep all four and uh, change them in different ways. I mean, the point is not to be 100% uh, accurate, you know, covering the gamut of everything you can do with this model. The point is to find some very interesting thing where you have kept most of the sliders in place and you've only moved one or two of them to and then to assess the impact of that. So if you have this kind of starting scenario where you have four resources, one is highly ranked, one is very lowly ranked, and two in the middle, what happens if you change the density of those two middle rank resources? Do that does it, you know, at what density value does it take for uh, the two middle ranked resources to outcompete the high ranked resource, for example, right? So you can do any number of experiments that you would like, but what I want you to do is when you get down to uh, finally doing it for um, inclusion in the write-up, I'd like you to really focus on just one or two sliders, not more than that, and to run a small handful of experiments, at least two up to maybe four or so, not so many that you can't understand what's going on. And it's okay to just move one slider four times or something like that. That's perfectly okay. And the whole point is that this simulation model is dynamic and it changes every time you run it. So uh, this allows you to do a bunch of scenario modeling and learn about what a real forger may or may not actually do in, in the real archaeological record. And what I want you to do in the in the write-up at the very end is to sort of reflect on the use, utility of these simulation models as opposed to only relying on archaeological data to pick out the dynamics of the past in a way that's very difficult to do. So hopefully that made some sense. Uh, and yeah, this is the last lab. And I know it's a little bit out of the ordinary, but hopefully you'll find it interesting.